our flag will wave on high only so long as the people beneath it are provided for. If they are oppressed, if they suffer hunger, if they're in want of clothing and shelter, they will ignore all flags save one, the flag of revolt. You live in a vast country. Your land is rich for agricultural purposes. Seven million farms spread over one billion, fifty-five million acres of fertile soil. You grow 13% of the world's wheat, 53% of its corn, 50% of its cotton, and huge crops of tobacco, potatoes, rice, sugar beets, grapes, oranges, crops of every nature and diversity. From the land come foodstuffs in abundance, and from the land come inexhaustible stores of mineral wealth. You produce 37% of the world's coal, 29% of its iron ore, 32% of its copper, 62% of its oil. Your mountains are covered with millions of acres of fine timber. Your rivers are the source of 35% of the world's electrical energy. And for utilizing this energy and these minerals, you have thousands of plants and factories that are models of efficiency. You turn out 67% of the world's silk goods, 43% of its chemicals, 67% of its rubber goods, 41% of its steel, 80% of its passenger automobiles, and 66% of its trucks. You have built huge planes and long, broad highways and fast trains so that your raw materials can move swiftly and easily to the mills and factories and the finished products to the markets and the stores. You have hundreds of mighty cities for the distribution of your many products. Your stores bulge with the finest of goods and foods. Your banks are filled with billions of dollars. And in more than 1,700 laboratories, there are over 33,000 scientists seeking and discovering new methods of producing even more goods for you, even more foodstuffs. And all this wealth for only a comparatively small number of you. And yet, what you now possess is next to nothing in comparison with what you can possess if you utilize fully your resources, your energies, your capacities. The National Survey of Potential Productive Capacity shows that in 1935, the resources, manpower, technology, and equipment existing in the United States could provide every one of your families with an income of nearly $5,000. Ralph E. Flanders, former vice president of the American Society of Engineers, says that the practical limit of production and distribution of goods in your country is beyond conception. The Federal Council of Churches recently told the pastors of America that the physical and engineering resources of America are now available to produce the abundant life for all of you. After surveying the country's resources, Fortune magazine asserts that all the serious problems that now confront you are those of abundance. You have 50% of the world's energy, 127 million major machines, 700 million installed horsepower. You have the transportation and distribution facilities. You have the technical knowledge. And universities give you over 4,000 new engineers each year. You have the equipment and money available for still more rapid laboratory advance. There are millions of you trained and ready to do the work. You have everything with which to produce abundantly for all. And yet, 
for 11 tragic years. 10 to 12 million of you have been idle and unproductive. Your houses have deteriorated so that you're desperately in need of more than 20 million new homes. Your great industrial machine is working at only one half its capacity. 10 million of you are employed only part of the time. Four million of you are working only by virtue of public borrowed money. 45 million of your dependents are living on public donations or private charity. Mortgages are plastered on 71% of your productive farmland. And there are those hundreds of thousands of you who no longer possess even mortgaged soil to till. Each year, thousands of you older workers are joining the unemployed because of labor-saving machines. Each year, 500,000 of your young people are thrown on a shrinking labor market. The educational system is curtailed by closed schools, shortened hours, decreased teaching staffs. One third of your children are living under tragic conditions of slow starvation. You need 30,000 more physicians. You need 150,000 more dentists. Each day, an average of $100 million is lost to you through refusal to permit the full use of your industry. In the first seven years of the Depression, you have lost the equivalent of decent food, decent clothing, decent homes for 25 millions of your fellow citizens. Your tax burdens are increasing. The federal debt of 42 billion which your children will have to pay, grows at the rate of $300 million every month. You have a country rich in resources, mechanical and physical equipment, technical knowledge, manpower. You can produce plenty of everything for everyone. Yet, your country is plagued by unemployment, empty factories, idle machines, poverty, Economists are now agreed that the Depression could not have occurred without the loss of purchasing power by a majority of you. Once purchasing power is restored to you, the economic system will function again. Mass purchasing power will create the need for more goods, and millions of you will go to work making them. And you millions receiving wages once again will be able to buy. Factories will run at full capacity. Business will flourish. And the depression will be at an end. Now, the question is, what caused this loss of purchasing power in the first place? Some economists say the rest of the world no longer need purchase from America the amount of goods they once purchased so your goods remain idle. Business slumps, and you're unemployed and without an income. Certain economists attribute your plight to jobs dwindling because of machines throwing you out of work. Without work, you cannot buy goods. Still other economists say you have a surplus of goods. You must wait until there is a scarcity. Then profits will rise and the system will function again. Some economists believe lack of opportunity for investment is the cause. 20% of the national income each year is saved. In the past, this was used for building new plants and machines. But today, industries are able to finance themselves. And so these billions stagnate in banks and insurance companies. This prevents the use of 20% of the wealth produced by industry. Business slumps, unemployment follows, and the system breaks down. Whatever the cause, 
the economists are agreed upon the solution. Adequate purchasing power in your hands. Purchasing power in your hands will allow you to utilize fully your rich resources, your technical equipment, your training, the wealth your country possesses. In 1932, after three years of depression, you voted out of office a Republican administration that had proven itself incapable of solving the dilemma of poverty in the midst of plenty. You voted into office an administration that promised a program that would solve this problem. This program called for the solution of poverty in the midst of plenty by abolishing the plenty. The New Deal proposed to create artificial scarcity. Artificial scarcity would create higher prices. And higher prices were supposed to bring prosperity. So during the past eight years, 50% of the time and energy of this administration has been devoted to creating artificial scarcity. Your cotton has been plowed under, your wheat and corn burned, your cattle, hogs, sheep slaughtered. Your farmers have been paid public money not to grow crops. And after eight years of endeavoring to abolish your hard-earned abundance, after eight years of endeavoring to block progress, your economic system remains in the doldrums. There are still millions of you unemployed. There are still empty factories. Still millions of families living in wretched homes. Still millions of you undernourished. Still millions in need of medical and dental care. And finally, the administration itself acknowledges failure by abandoning its program. All normal domestic problems are suddenly forgotten. The administration has announced its hope of reducing unemployment through wartime activities. After 11 years of depression, your plight has become even more tragic. A flag will wave on high, only so long as the people beneath it are provided for. If they are oppressed, if they suffer hunger, if they're in want of clothing and shelter, they will ignore all flags save one, the flag of revolt. During the past 11 years, many plans to solve the economic crisis have been brought to your attention. With time, most of them have disappeared. But one, the Townsend Plan, not only has continued to attract your attention, but with each day, each week, each month, it's gained increasing support. What is the Townsend Plan? The Townsend Plan recognizes with all leading economists that the economic system will not function until you people have adequate purchasing power with which to buy goods. So it proposes to enact into law a tested method of placing this purchasing power in your hands. It proposes to do this through an old age retirement annuity. To justify an old age retirement annuity should not be necessary in so wealthy a country as yours. Yet, if such a justification is needed, it exists in the contributions you elderly citizens have made toward the growth and greatness of your country. Having functioned productively throughout the greater part of your lives, you are deserving of a secure and comfortable old age. The Townsend Plan would make those of you 60 years of age and over eligible for the annuity. Those of you over 60 who are employed at remunerative work would necessarily retire to become eligible. Upon enactment into law, the amount of money you would receive would not be less than $50 per month. As this money poured into trade channels, the economic system would begin to function properly. With the economic system functioning properly, the national income would rise. 
and with it would rise the amount of your annuity until it reached the maximum of $200 per month. This would assure you of a comfortable living standard and your declining days would be serene and full. The national income would rise and provide the maximum annuity because the Townsend Plan offers a tested method of assuring this. All you elderly citizens eligible to receive the annuity would have to spend it within 35 days. It is this program of enforced spending of an adequate amount of purchasing power that is the heart of the Townsend Plan. It is this that makes the Townsend Plan a national recovery plan. Upon enactment into law, approximately 10 million of you would be eligible for the annuity. At once, you would possess the purchasing power that you now lack. You would put it into immediate use. You would not be allowed to hoard it. You would not be permitted to place it in bank vaults to stagnate. Within 35 days after receiving it, you would pour it back into trade channels. You would provide yourselves with the necessities of life, the food and clothing you need so desperately. You would build yourselves homes. You would avail yourselves of the best medical and dental attention. You would even enjoy a certain number of luxuries. Your days would be filled with happiness. As you supplied your needs, goods would begin to move. They would continue to move because each month you would put a great amount of money into circulation. With the moving of goods, the national economy would begin to function properly. All over the country this industrial activity would take place because you live in every section of the land. You elderly citizens would open up four million jobs by your retirement to receive the annuity. By your spending, you would assist millions of younger workers to secure jobs. You younger people, too, would purchase goods. And you would do this freely, for you would have no fear of a destitute old age. Nor would business fluctuations or recessions throw you out of work, for your senior citizens would provide business with a guaranteed market month after month, year after year. You people of America, all of you, for the first time, you would be able to put to work all your rich resources, your fine mechanical and physical equipment, your technical knowledge and manpower, so that you would produce plenty of everything for everyone. But some of you are critics of the Townsend Plan. You say such a plan will not work, and so you ridicule or ignore it. Have you ever studied the Townsend Plan? Have you ever read it over carefully, point by point? Do so, and you'll discover that the annuities it proposes could easily come from a 2% gross income tax. What is a gross income tax? Yes, that's what I'd like to know. What is this gross income tax proposition anyway? A gross income tax is a tax on the total amount earned by a person or a business. This includes wages paid for your service as employees. This includes compensation you receive for your professional service. If you're a businessman, this includes the profits that arises from the transaction of your business. If you're a landlord or a stockholder, it includes money you receive from rent, interest, dividends, and securities. But not all of you would be assessed this tax. Only those earning $3,000 or more per year. I earn only $25 a week. I can't afford to pay it, even if it would relieve me from supporting my old folks. You would not pay this tax unless you were earning $63 or more per week. When I have good crops, I earn about $3,500. How much of this should be taxed under this plan? You would pay a 2% tax on $500. Your first $3,000 are exempt. My average income is around $6,000. How much of my income would be taxed? $3,000 of your income would be taxed. The first $3,000 are exempt. 
So you see, this is an equitable tax. The heaviest burden falls upon those best able to bear it. Taxes, taxes, that's all I do is pay taxes. We already have too many taxes now. Business is stifling from them. Whatever good might come would be worthless in the light of new taxes. You people have not studied the Townsend plan. Otherwise, you'd see that under it, taxes would be less than they are today. For enactment of the Townsend plan would remove many costly institutions now supported by public funds. The poor fund and the public dole would immediately be eliminated. Federal and state contributions to old age charity pensions would be eliminated. The payment of millions to persons past 60 on WPA and other relief rolls would be eliminated. A future tax on payrolls involved in the Social Security Act would be eliminated. And as the effect of the plan upon industry would make itself felt, the expense of supporting millions of your able-bodied fellow citizens would be eliminated. As these millions secure jobs, the various other expenses involved in stop-gap depression methods would go. It is clear that under the Townsend plan, taxes would be less than they are now. Well, even if the Townsend plan would reduce taxes, where would the money come from in the first place? That's right. There isn't enough money to put it into operation. At the present time, the total gross annual income in the United States aggregates 365 billions. 65 billions of this would be exempt under the Townsend Plan since it represents wages and salaries below 250 a month and business incomes of less than 3,000. This leaves a taxable amount of 300 billions. A 2% tax upon it would yield six billions annually. This six billions is far more than enough to put the Townsend plan immediately into operation. Sure, there's enough money, but that's no sign the tax will work. You've got to show me I'm from Missouri. A gross income tax has been successfully in operation in Indiana for several years. A gross income tax has been successfully in operation in Hawaii for a number of years. William Borthwick, tax commissioner of the Territory of Hawaii, says, The gross income tax will work because it has worked. We have proven that to our own satisfaction here in Hawaii. The Townsend plan is not just another plan. It is a tested, a tried and proven plan. What's the difference between the Townsend plan and the Social Security Act? The Social Security Act pays pensions only to those of you over 65. The Townsend Plan would provide for all at the age of 60. The Social Security Act pays pensions only to those of you who qualify by your earnings, thus excluding many millions of you because you do not earn enough. The Townsend Plan would provide for all regardless of earning power. The Social Security Act obtains its funds from a tax largely falling upon those of you earning less than 250 per month. The Townsend Plan would exempt you low-income groups and obtain the same amount from those best able to pay it. Under the Social Security Act, 15% of you now taxed will receive nothing at all. 15% will get $10 a month, and 20% will average less than $15 a month. Under the Townsend Plan, no retired worker would get less than $50 a month. Under the Social Security Act, those of you earning more than $250 a month will get substantial pensions, while those earning less will get meager ones, if any at all. Under the Townsend Plan, all of you receive the same size pension. Under the Social Security Act, you wives past 65 receive a pension half the size of your husband's. Under the Townsend Plan, there'd be no discrimination because of race, creed, color, sex, or class status. Finally, and most important of all, the Social Security Act is a drain upon the national economy, whereas the Townsend Plan would provide you elderly citizens with an active function keeping the system going properly. You would not be burdens, but rather valuable assets. Since Dr. Townsend first made you people pension conscious, 
a growing stream of your fellow citizens marshal their forces behind his fight to enact the Townsend Plan. Today, the reliable Gallup Institute poll estimates that 20 millions of you wish to see the plan enacted into the law of the land. To carry out this wish, a national organization directs a widely flung program of educational activities. The executive offices of the Townsend Organization are located in centrally situated Chicago and occupy two whole floors of office space. Here are the editorial offices of the Townsend National Weekly, which has a wide circulation throughout the entire nation. Here is the book and literature department, which distributes millions of pieces of Townsend literature annually. Here are the production offices of the Visual Education Department, which turns out posters, phonograph records, slide films, and motion pictures. Here is the main office of the Townsend Trade Ticket Division, a department that utilizes the vast Townsend patronage to secure financial aid for Townsend educational activities. Here are the headquarters of the vast organization department, which supervises the activities of the many national representatives located in every state of the Union. Throughout the country, in every state, are thousands of towns and clubs. There are an average of more than 20 clubs in every congressional district in the country. In the nation's capital, a political bureau is maintained to keep Congress informed of the pension desires of 20 million of your fellow citizens. In the hands of your representatives in Congress is the Townsend National Recovery Plan. Daily reports on the status of the bill are sent out by the Washington Bureau to the clubs throughout the nation. Daily new clubs are being formed in every congressional district to increase the political strength of the plan. Already, the annual Townsend National Conventions surpass in numbers the official delegates to both the Republican and Democratic conventions combined. In a world shaken by wars and dictatorships, in a world of insecurity dominated by intolerance and brutality, the Townsend Plan forges ahead to offer you an immediate and tested means of preserving democratic government in your country. And with it goes the faith of 20 millions of you and your fellow citizens who see in its enactment into law productive activity for your youth, serenity for your aged, a rich and happy life for all in this land of abundance.